Good afternoon. First, I want to thank each of you for joining us today. You've all been invited to be a part of Context Data to Delivery event due to mutual passion for technology and information. For those unfamiliar, Contact was born from our commitment to building for a better society and the idea of sharing how we use construction technology on our projects. This is the third year we're holding this event. Previously, we held these events in person at different locations across the US, but because of the pandemic, we've shifted to a virtual format, which has allowed us the opportunity to expand the event nationally. So how did we arrive at our theme of data to delivery? We deliver solutions for our clients on complex projects across the country, which generates data throughout our organization. Our community of innovators collects, visualizes, analyzes, and automates this internal data to transform it into actual, actionable information that empowers our people and supports our projects. This data to delivery strategy connects our teams to data, technology, and building analytics so that we can create value for our customers. Using business intelligence tools already at their disposal, our innovators build custom solutions and applications that provide everything from pricing and cost insights to schedule benchmarks, productivity tracking, safety metrics, and more. Today, we're bringing together experts from across the US to share exciting innovations and tools that revolutionize how we collaborate to design, build, and operate our buildings. This year's all virtual experience focuses on delivery effective data strategies that make connected construction and automated building performance a reality. I'm excited to share that we're starting today with two impressive guest speakers. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Usama Fayed, chairman and CEO of Open Insights, and the first person to hold the title Chief Data Officer at Yahoo, and Professor Ibrahim O'Day, Research Director and Founder of the Global Leaders in Construction Management Research Initiative at Columbia University here in New York, who will join to illustrate the AEC industry's environment, the unique environment and mega technology trends reshaping our industry. Following the keynote address, please join us directly in our technology exhibit hall. We have set up 12 virtual booths hosted by Skanska experts for you to experience today. The booths are organized into four halls each with a different focus, data collection, data visualization, data analysis, and data automation. Every exhibit booth features a short presentation of the technology or tool, and you can enter live video chats with Skanska's technology subject matter experts and take virtual tours of projects across the US. Don't forget, as you engage with our experts throughout the exhibit floor, every booth visited is an entry to win an Oculus Go, so good luck. After the technology hall uh, exhibit hall concludes, please join us back in the live broadcast at four o'clock Eastern for an exciting panel moderated by our own Danielle O'Connell, Skanska's Director of Emerging Technology Services about how data analysis improves facility and asset management. Our panelists are Dr. Luciana Birdie, Capital Program and Environmental Affairs Director at the Massachusetts Port Authority, Sala Eckhart, Director of Transformation Services at Microsoft, and Gregory Spiro, Senior Mechanical Engineer at the Georgia Institute of Technology. It should be a really exciting few hours. Again, thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the event. With that, I'd like to welcome our keynote speakers, Dr. Uh, Professor O'Day and Dr. Fayette. Thank you, Anita, and uh, it's a uh... A uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, conference, uh, focusing on themes that are near and dear to my heart, data analytics, and I'm going to be speaking about AI and, and digital, which fit in very nicely with them. Um, just a couple of words. Um, I, I have uh, invited uh, my, my co-speaker, uh, Professor Ibrahim Ode, and, and I will ask him to introduce himself. A few words of introduction on me. I've spent three decades uh, of my life basically trying to make and, and making uh, sometimes successfully AI work in many uh, fields, uh, starting with uh, data science analysis at NASA JPL to platforms uh, at Microsoft to doing a couple of startups that worked with some of the world's uh, Fortune 500 companies, got acquired by Yahoo to become the first chief data officer there, where I also built up Yahoo Research and 
created both platforms and, and new ways of, of using the technology in, in advertising. Uh, then uh, Open Insights, where we actually work with, with the world's largest companies on figuring out data strategy, figuring out how to make AI use cases really work. And uh, most recently took on the role of executive director at the newly formed Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University, where we're trying to create the world's top uh, AI Institute, uh, experiential AI referring to human-centric AI, AI with, with a human in the loop. With that, uh, Ibrahim, maybe you uh, introduce yourself with a few words. Absolutely, thank you, Osama. My name is Ibrahim Aude again, and I'm the founding director of the GLCM, uh, which is a Global Leaders in Construction Management Initiative at Columbia, and a faculty member within the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, for the sake of time, let me share just a quick three points from my background. One is I do work on the area of management strategy and especially digital transformation by helping engineering construction firms understand how specific technologies and trends can intersect with their business models. Second, I do teach a couple of courses in the area of construction here in Colombia. And humbly, I would say I was actually the first professor uh, to also develop the ever first MOOC courses in the construction industry. And now I have five of them under the Coursera platform. We have closer to 200,000 learners took uh, my classes in the last couple of years from 190 countries. And during the pandemic, we witnessed around 2,000 new learners joining these classes every week. Uh, last point maybe to share, uh, I sit on several advisory board members uh, in engineering construction firms, as well as several uh, contech startups and uh, participate with an advisory role at the World Economic Forum, uh, as well as the GI Hub, or the Global Infrastructure Hub, which is an initiative started in 2014 to support the G20 agenda. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I'm very looking forward for this great event. So off, uh, off to our talk, um, and wh what I'd like to do is kind of give you a quick overview. There's gonna be basically four, four parts here. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about digital AI and data. And many of you may wonder, what does data have to do with AI? And the answer is uh, everything. My subtitle for this section is how to avoid going blind. And I'll explain that. Uh, but basically uh, the, the goal here is to demystify AI. What, how should you be thinking about it? What does it mean for your business? And you know, what's the hype versus the reality? Uh, I'll share five lessons learned uh, on this during my, uh, my career. I'll use an example of the future for kind of from smart windows to smart buildings that shows that where the industry is heading in general uh, is also pretty scary when it comes to how much data will be generated and how much compute will be available even within the buildings we construct. Um, then I uh, will switch over to uh, Professor Ode who will cover you know, in detail how is this relevant to the construction industry in particular in the context of digital transformation. We'll come back at the end with some concluding thoughts and give you our contact info in case you have questions and you wanna grab the slides or any, any of that. Uh, so digital transformation, what can I say? It's old, even though many of you think it's new, it's been around for six or seven decades. It's been happening in banking for a, for a long time, not necessarily the right way. Um, and I, the thought there is, can we automate much of this white collar label and people were, you know, worried, will this replace jobs? Will this eliminate my job, et cetera? Uh, the, the opposite actually happened. So we went through several waves uh, and I'll, I'll just, an iconic case for me is, think of an accountant of 60 or 70 years ago, right? You had to have good handwriting. Uh, you probably had to have very good addition skills in your head. And you had to like be able to open these big ledgers and you know step through them and all of that. Well, what does an accountant do today? It's a completely different job, right? Uh, uh, and and you're, you're delivering much higher value to the organization because you're really thinking about what these numbers uh, are saying, not how do I get the right numbers? Uh, uh, assuming that that's you know, mostly aided by software and digitization and, and some AI in some cases. Uh, but what is interesting is we have more accountants today than we ever had in the history of humanity, right? So we didn't replace them. We just figured out how to make the role much more useful and figured out how to, you know, what machines should be doing, addition and arithmetic, versus what a human should be doing, which is thinking and common sense and so forth. And that's an important theme to keep in mind. Now, with the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 really changed our lives. You know, we couldn't go to the stores as an example. So we basically 
uh, everyone had to go digital. And this has happened in almost every industry from education to uh, construction management to scientific uh, conferences to analytics to what have you. Uh, the shock brought a rapid culture change, right? Uh, digitization was kind of in the background for most companies, but nothing like a chalk uh, to, to kind of change uh, the attitude, right? So uh, wisdom usually brings risk aversion and crises uh, allow you to escape that risk aversion box, right? So the attitude was, let's wait and see what others do, et cetera. Uh, but we got in a mode where basically if you're not digital, you're either dead or you're walking dead. And that quickly got people to say, you know, the heck with it. Uh, let's move on. Uh, let's see what happens. And suddenly all the uh, doubting Thomases were saying, wow, look, this is actually working. It's not so risky after all. Uh, in fact, it created a whole new set of uh, uh, ways of thinking about the business and how a business interwe interweaves itself with its partners, its customers, and so forth. And that has taken us to the age of digital uh, hyper growth, uh, really where actually this is where we start going blind. And, and what do I mean by going blind? But let me first give you a couple of examples. Um, here are examples of companies uh, that did not digitize, right? In the time, you know, Kodak invented digital photography, but never embraced it, right? And, and they were replaced. And what I like to say is, to me, it's, all, you know, it's, it's amazing and shocking that the company went bankrupt after 124 years. They were around for over a century. You know, go to retail, JC Penney, again, around for over a century. At 118 years old, they go bankrupt, right? And the biggest mistake they made against Amazon and the others, uh, Costco and, and, and Walmart and so forth, was not digitizing enough, right? On the other hand, you have industries that fully embrace digitization. I use Vitality in insurance, uh, where they became, you know, they, they plugged in with 100 wearable technologies, and re reduce cost dramatically. 40% reduced cost in hospital admissions, 14% cost reduction, 25% reduction in hospital stays. Uh, Capital One in the US is a great example of how to do it with credit cards. Uh, the returns were incredible and their CEO actually basically says it was all about digital. Uh, I like this, this bank DBS in, in uh, Singapore, which basically went from being considered dead to becoming the market leader over a period of five years, right? Purely by saying the heck with it, we're going digital and suddenly the world changed for them, right? So this is important to keep in mind. Now, what do you lose when you go digital? What you lose if you're kind of in the B2C business is customer intimacy. If you're in the B2B business is understanding what's happening with your products. So things, even though you, know, you, you digitize because you want the workflow to go faster, what you quickly realize is that, hey, I've lost the ability that humans had to tell me when customers are unhappy, why are they leaving, when are they leaving, what are they go who are they going to, what should I do about it, right? And the question is, can we restore this intimacy? And the answer is yes. Actually, digital comes with a lot of data. But if you do digital without thinking through what you're doing with data, you go blind because you no longer understand what's happening with your business, with your products, with your customers. Um, you know, this, of course, happens in banking. You know, they went from traditional to uh, at scale. And doing that, they lost a lot of intimacy. And by the way, this is an example of how to do digital wrong, right? Uh, everything became more expensive for them, right? The front office became more expensive. The back office became more expensive. You know, risk, compliance, all of these things. Hundreds of millions of dollars a year for a large bank are spent just on risk, deciding whether a customer is risky or not. When in the old days, when there was no digital, just the branch manager and the staff knew it, right? They knew who was a good risk, who was a bad credit risk, who's growing, who's shrinking, et cetera. Uh, so uh, this is basically um, uh, something that, a quick example here to show you, uh, you know, a simple deposit, right? Kelly goes and deposits some money in the bank, account good standing, end of story. Well, guess what? This bank could and should know that Kelly has a student debt, Kelly just got married, right? And that Kelly actually has shown many signs that she wants to buy, she's saving to buy a house, right? Uh, this data is available to the bank, but if you walk into any bank and say, can you get me this information about your customers? The answer is typically no. Why? Well, the data is there. They don't know how to get to it. They don't know how to get to it in time. They don't know how to consume it right. What they could have done, of course, is come up with offers upon that deposit that are much more relevant to Kelly and much healthier for their business. Uh, one theme here is that you go digital and the data flux is about 100 times. So most organizations essentially drown under this data. 
The majority of this data is unstructured and most databases today only speak structured. So you get another quandary here. Uh, without the proper data, you go blind. Uh, and uh, machine learning and AI that we'll talk about in a second need actually detailed data to work, to, to help you kind of reason on top of the space. So what is AI and, and machine learning and all of this? Well, AI is a very old concept again, right? From the 40s and 50s. I actually argue earlier in the century. Uh, very relevant uh, uh, body of work. The name became official in 1956. And despite much hype and fear, there were a lot of successes. However, there was a lot of excessive hype. So two AI winters ensued, right? The first one happened in the mid 70s. The second one happened in the 90s, where people basically went from AI is a solution to everything to I don't touch AI, I don't do AI. AI, I have nothing, no idea about it, right? And uh, by the way, what is AI? Well, it's basically, uh, simply put, it's using computers to simulate human intelligence. Big problem with this definition, we don't know how to define intelligence. We don't know what is intelligence. And we don't know even simple things like common sense reasoning that all of us do. We look at something and we say, hey, this doesn't make sense to me. Getting a computer to say that is much, much harder and much more challenging. Within this, there's a subfield called machine learning, which is a subset with, of AI concerned with, can you use the data to try to emulate what humans do? And by the way, we have used data historically, you know, in, in chess playing, in, in uh, Jeopardy, and recently the game of Go, and we can beat the top humans in, in this world using AI. However, uh, this kind of intelligence has nothing to do with human intelligence. It's a completely different uh, ilk of intelligence. Uh, it's mostly automation and mostly regression through machine learning, right? Uh, so, so why am I telling you all this? Well, because I see the same kind of hype happening, right? You hear from Elon Musk, you hear from, you know, China is, is you know, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, everybody was scared of Japan's fifth generation program, which by the way, amounted to nothing in the end. Uh, and now today, everybody's saying, oh, we're all going to be jobless, brainless, and, and China 2030 is the new you know, Japanese fifth generation. Uh, this is all going to lead to another winter, I am sure. So we will go through a period of time where everybody will say, oh, this is all hype. This is not good. Reality is, though, uh, this is uh, 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 real and it is useful. Uh, the subfield of AI, machine learning, survived both AI winters before, right? And I believe it will survive the, the, the next winter that's coming that I talk about. Um, What's so special about machine learning? Well, we have a lot more data. While we don't have a lot more you know, brilliant algorithms, we have a lot of data. And that is the big difference. This is where machine learning shines, right? Now, two things to watch out for here. I mentioned 90% of the data in any organization is, is structured, uh, is unstructured, sorry. So you only benefit from 10% if you don't think it through. And if you go to big data where you try to deal with unstructured data, 85% of projects fail. So you got to approach it with care and you got to think through what you're doing in that field. Uh, I learned many lessons doing real pragmatic AI. Uh, the big lessons I'd like to share with you, and each one of these is a talk on its own and happy to share with you more material on this, but you got to make the problem very, very narrow. The narrower you make it, the more you can kind of describe the whole universe for that sub-universe that you narrowed it down to and the much higher your chances of success are. Data is a necessary enabler, so what's your story for data? Uh, these AI and machine learning algorithms expect a different kind of data than humans expect. The data you do for uh, BI, for business intelligence, for reporting, is very different than the data that an algorithm wants in granular uh, detail. Uh, uh, you need to kind of look for intent when you take an action, either as an organization or with consumers, you know, what is the intent here of, of the customer? What are they trying to do, be they a business or a consumer? And finally, the, the biggest lesson is there is no autonomous AI. If somebody tries to tell you this AI knows what to do, they're lying to you. There is no general AI. There's very, very specific AIs. And what I believe in, it is all about human-centered AIs, system that help us, help human perform tasks that are meant for humans, for, for machines, uh, uh, much better. Uh, a logo I like or, or a tagline I like to use is AI is not about replacing the human with a robot. AI is about taking the robot out of the human. So there are tasks that robots should be doing and they do much better than humans. And there are tasks that robots cannot do that only humans can do. And that's what experiential AI is all about uh, uh, at the university uh, of Northeastern University. So data. So you need to have your data story straight. So how do you get your data story straight? Well, 
Business expect data to be reliable, affordable, timely, accurate, comprehensive, unified, accessible, easy to understand, and easy to embed. And of course, they want to do it. You know, affordable is a big deal. Reality is quite the opposite, right? In almost any organization you go into, it's too expensive, it's too unreliable, it's questionable quality, it's fragmented, difficult to get to, confusing, what have you, right? Uh, the solution we have found over the years is what we call a data as a service, which means you don't let people do their own data projects. You kind of centralize it and do it on a platform. We like to call it, and, and big data figures big in this platform. Uh, an example of this is, for example, I had to put a whole bunch of data together at Barclays when I was their global chief data officer in London. Uh, we did it for cybersecurity reasons, but the minute we had it working in this data as a service, everybody came to us, financial crime, saying, hey, I really need this data, fraud, I really need this data, marketing, I really need this data, uh, risk, I really need this data. And then the game, the game became, you know, who has access, who can see it, who can not see it, and all of that. But what the enabler was is that big data platform acting as a data as a service. Of course, you need to think about your data strategy. How do you map your business need like revenue and cost saves? Relevance, what do you need to take to market? Reference, are you building to a reference architecture? Regulation, are you violating anybody's laws and paying huge fines? You know, in my days, Barclays was paying almost all of its profits, two to three billion pounds a year in fines every year, right? And a lot of them having to do with data and we had to fix that. And finally, the roadmap. How do you take that strategy and approach it incrementally and, and deliver results? So a few words here about kind of um, our philosophy is we ask these questions and we say, look, think about answering these questions through a data as a service, right? Where it has built-in data governance, built-in quality and standards, and it's, it's built kind of iteratively over time because if you try to build it as a big project, it never works. Uh, some lessons learned here from our uh, data as a service implementations. You know, typically we see people breaking the budget. Uh, we, we actually use a lot of automation and a lot of accelerators to do it quickly. Garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't have data governance and quality, you're not going to get much out of this, you know, newsflash. Structured data only is a big trap because as I mentioned, the majority of the data is unstructured and you have to have a story for that. A recipe for failure is to try to tackle everything at once. These things are incremental. So we came up with a blueprint on how to do them, you know, in slices incrementally. And I don't have the time to cover that. And then finally, lack of talent, right? And this is why we partner with a lot of our uh, customers and partners to help them with the talent that understands big data and AI and how to make it work. What about the construction industry? Well, you know, digitization is happening on multiple levels, and I'm going to let uh, Professor Ode kind of go into the details here. But the artifacts are getting digitized, and there's a good job happening there. Uh, the workflows are slowly getting digitized, probably not enough of that there. You know, think about your business uh, when you run a project, uh, how much of these experiences, corrections, disruptions, disputes, revisions, et cetera, are you capturing for future use, IoT events, site surveillance? Uh, uh, applying the data, uh, AI on all this data requires you to have this data in a shape that you can use. And uh, uh, Professor Ode will go into some of the details of how digitization creates a lot more data and how you should think about digitization and leverage it to kind of apply AI on all this, this, these new digital citizens of, of, of the business of, of construction. With that, I'm gonna uh, wrap up my part with a couple of minutes uh, uh, an, an introduction on kind of where the future is heading, at least in, in my mind, right? I saw this use case that blew my mind. It actually was done by Columbia University. Uh, one wing of the Dallas airport was fitted with dynamic glass windows. You know, they tint depending on time of day and, and the sun direction and all of that, compared with a symmetrical area on the other side. So beautiful A-B test, right? Uh, the spaces both had waiting areas and, and retail places like a bar and, and you know, uh, retailers. The study kind of looked at the behavior of these uh, uh, passengers over six months. Shockingly, well, first of all, 20% savings in energy, right? Because you're, you're blocking more of the sun during the day. Doubling of revenue at the, at the bar, <laughs> which, which like is crazy, right? You just, the only difference between the two bars is one was in an area that was protected by these windows, the other was not. And generally happier passengers, they dwelled more, uh, they they uh, they were more comfortable, etc. The Dallas, uh, you know, uh, uh, Daily News talked about this. Uh, we have a reference to that. But anyway, so 15% cooler, uh, actually 15 degrees cooler, 83% more dwell time, and 
2% more sales at the retailers in that section that actually had the, the, the dimming windows, which are shown here. Uh, so that is not the end of the story though. The story goes further into computing, right? Computing of the old days was mainframes, right? In the thousands of instances, uh, personal computing brought it to millions to now hundreds of millions. Mobile computing took us to the billions, right? And the future, uh, as I see it actually, which is, you know, uh, uh, in ambient computing in the building itself, which is going to be in the trillions between 5G and between the computation. So what do I mean by this? And I use the case study from VIEW uh, Inc here. Uh, you know, they do the windows that kind of uh, shade out and they control these. So there's smart glass to allow you to control the tint. There are networks to allow you to control the, the windows and the timing and there's software with predictive algorithms and all of that. But what is exciting here is you take a window and you place on top of it a transparent LCD or LED and suddenly that window with the proper tinting, tinting can turn into a display, right? Not just a display, but an interactive display. So you can actually set the settings on that window uh, and you can actually turn it into a whiteboard. You can turn it into a conference uh, thing. And this could be for a partition or an external window, which kind of completely changes the concept of a waiting area, right? You can embed entertainment in it. If you don't like entertainment, you can put in, you know, different scenery in your windows, right? So to me, that blows my mind. But what's even bigger is think of this whole skin of the building as a big 5G connectivity layer with built-in edge computing because of all these devices for control. Guess what? When they're not controlling the window, they can be used to do computation. And Vue has their own kind of what they call the Vue OS around digital twins. Uh, applying machine learning and, and using that data on the network to do computation uh, on, on the windows of a building of all things. One of the oldest construction material around windows, right, are now kind of doing computation, which, which blows my mind. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Ode, uh, who can advance the slide and uh, uh, tell us about how uh, this all plays out into digital. Thank you, Osama. From, from, from my end, I would like to share with you my take on how all this linked to construction and show the changing yet exciting environment to our industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in, in, the last, in the last 20 years, the global annual productivity growth in construction was lagging behind the overall economy and other industries. In the US as well, there was consistent decline in construction productivity since the late 1960s. Labor productivity has declined by an average of 1.7%, while overall economy has grown by around 1.6%. So we do have a productivity problem, as maybe all of us are aware of by now. The reason of this is because the unique industry characteristics that we have. Still, our industry main preference in building projects is to go with the lowest bidder. I'm happy, though, to see some promising changes toward design build and IPD. We also are highly fragmented industry, and from a profitability perspective in general, our industry is consistently outperformed by most of the S&P 500 companies. In addition to the industry unique characteristics, we do suffer from common challenges connected to data and specifics, such as repetitive reporting, unorganized data, uh, multiple data systems, and lack of system connectivity. And some studies even showed that around 95% of all data captured in our industry goes unused. Uh, several years ago, I joined the World Economic Forum on a specific project to study the future of the construction industry. One element we focused on are what the trends are reshaping the way we're delivering projects. We divided all the trends into four categories, as we can see in this slide. Example words highlighted from this list. We have around 200,000 people are added daily to urban areas, and the need of affordable housing is in a rise. Projects are becoming also more complex. We have an aging workforce, and finding the right talents are still a major concern for us. And with most or more shift toward digital services and somehow rise of use of data, we started to see more concerns about also cyber threats. So to be able to deal with a unique environment characteristics, challenges, and such a trends, we need to work together in a three levels to accomplish a promising transformation to our industry. Those three levels are industrial collaborative level, a government level, and a company level. Under the company level, we showed many promising business practices and use cases from many firms from all around the world, including from Skanska here in the US and Skanska AB in, in Sweden. And we divided them into four groups. 
Let me focus in the coming slides on the area of technology and innovation and how that is linked in the rise of data and AI. In, in early 2010, our industry started to witness the rise of construction technology solutions to help both projects and firms. My colleague at McKinsey, who is currently working closely with my team here at Columbia, shared the following study with me. This study looked at more than 2,700 technology solution companies, and they divided all these firms based on their use cases into four groups. One group focusing on AI and data analytics, another one on digital twin technology, a third one on a 3D printing modularization and the rise of construction robotics, as well as last one is supply chain optimization. Despite this great rise of such technological solutions, one observation of this study showed that the construction technology landscape is moving more toward the platforms. It is also predicted that the combination of multiple platforms will coexist in the space. The platforms can be used in many ways from uh, managing work orders, design processes, equipment and productivity tracking, and also platforms empower firms to effectively report, analyze, and evolve through a combination of dashboards and real-time data collection. Last year during the pandemic, I managed to publish a chapter at the following book, and my chapter titled Digital Ecosystems in the Construction Industry. The chapter mirrors this, mirror this work and uh, gives more details of such platforms along with emerging trends and future directions and how data is one key fuel to the rise of such platforms. Now, let's shift discussion on how the industry has continued to grow with also venture capital activities. From 2014 to 2019, investors poured $25 billion into engineering construction technologies up from eight billion only over the previous five years. When we have a deeper look at the construction tech offerings across the project phases, it shows that the construction phase continues to be uh, the most active with a twice the investment activity and more active players than any other phases. Also what I found interesting from my end, that the use cases within these project phases reveals that AI, and advanced analytics experienced the highest proportionate share of activity with nearly 80% of companies involved in investment or transaction activity. Despite this exciting news, uh, again, from, from my end, uh, as, as the majority of you might know, our industry is still considered the second least digitized industry in the world after hunting and agriculture. So, so, so we beat them, right? So, uh, but, but now to be able to change such fact to improve our industry moving forward, it is important to understand how we came up with the level of digitization of any industry. The level of digitization can be measured using 27 indicators. They are divided into three categories. Digital assets, which shows the degree to which companies have digitized their physical assets. Digital usage shows the degree to which companies are involved digitally with customers and suppliers such as use of digital payments and digital marketing. And what differentiates leaders is the third category, the degree to which digital tools are put in the hands of members of the company. The, the accelerated wave of digital initiatives must not be confused with the real business and digital transformation needed for success in the digital age, which will lead, which will lead to be ready for a fourth industrial revolution. The digital initiatives are mostly about enabling business as usual and staying in the game. While digital transformation is about building real long-term competitive advantage to succeed. Last year, during the pandemic, we started to witness many engineering construction firms shifting toward digital solutions to help them sustain their businesses. It is as if the COVID-19 worked as a catalyst to expedite digital transformation to many firms in our industry and outside the industry. I'm currently involved in helping several firms in how to develop the right digital transformation strategy. And what we found from the literature so far, that only 30% of companies in all industries managed to successfully accomplish digital transformation. However, still 70% are failing. I can share from my lessons learned so far that there are three pillars for a successful digital transformation strategy, which they are aligned with the three categories under the level of digitization here. One focusing on technology, the other one on people, and the third one is on a process. From the technology aspect, 
We need to move beyond isolated pilots to more cohesive systems and also focus on fixing pain points rather than installing hottest IT solutions. But the people element, again, it is important to answer the question of who to involve in both the purchase and the implementation processes and always seek feedback from all parties involved. Again, the people pillar is one of the main important items in such a transition. During our literature, some studies showed that in digital transformation, only 10% goes to technology and 90% goes to people. So if we do not have the right team and talents within this journey to prepare a company to a digital world and find the right process to implement and leverage on the data collected, in, again, remind you, in, in an industry that is the second least digitized, you will end up observing for sure your company culture is your digital transformation strategy for breakfast. So coming to an end, I will close my part with one last slide that I really enjoy. The changes in technology all around us, and especially here in the construction industry, is rising exponentially with time. From a human adaptability point of view, we are lagging behind such changes. We need to find a way how to keep learning faster and governing smarter. From what we are studying so far, to be able to fill this gap between the two curves and catch them together, the use of AI and machine learning, as well as leverage on data collected, the data collected, will play a crucial role in our industry during this journey. With this, I hope I managed to cover my part right on time, and I will leave it to Osama to close from his end. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. So just uh, con concluding thoughts here. Um, I'm, I'm listing some issues for you to think about regarding, and hopefully this talk convinced you that digital leads to data, data is essential for AI, and without thinking through the data and the AI, you could seriously get in trouble with your digital transformation. Uh, these are kind of my uh, diagnostic questions. Um, I realize you guys may have a lot of other questions or may want copies of the slides, etc. I think, Ibrahim, if we show the next slide, um, uh, we give you our contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out on social media or directly by email. And uh, we will follow up to try to answer questions. And I think the team at Skanska also uh, volunteered to collect questions. And uh, we will work with them on uh, kind of publishing answers to the audience questions. Uh, with that, I would like, uh, to, uh, on behalf of Ibrahim and myself, to thank you for uh, listening. Uh, we hope you found uh, the material interesting. And more importantly, we hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.